I'm Ankit Agarwal, um, CEO at the K2S. Uh, we are into uh, supply chain execution space, uh, operational efficiencies, improvements, WMS implementations, uh, uh, specializing in uh, Blue Yonder WMS, uh, getting our feet wet into other WMSs as well as we're getting into a WMS, to, uh, WMS or uh, an application agnostic vision. So uh, uh, getting into soft on WMS is our uh, latest uh, new uh, uh, skill set and offering as well. Brian, you want to take a second and introduce yourself, uh, like job title, what you do kind of deal? Sure. Yeah. Hey, uh, so good morning. Um, I'm Brian Kraft. I'm our vice president of project management here at High Tech Infra Logistics. So, um, well, I guess I've been with the company for about seven years. Uh, came from UPS prior to that. Um, I has, I've started with AHS, which was acquired uh, a couple of years ago uh, under the High Tech brands and has since we've merged and integrated. So I have responsibilities for essentially all of our deployments that we do um, inside of the integrated systems division. Um, so all of our team members that are that are responsible for that report up through me, such as our software systems engineers, our robotic commissioning engineers, our coordination staff, our program and project managers, all kind of roll up through my umbrella. So I get to have a, a lot of fun overseeing multiple different facets of, of all of the different uh, products we sell and deliver. Uh, and provide our clients. So um, that's a me in a nutshell. So uh, well, uh, that's yeah. it. Jim, you want to do an intro as well, man? Yeah, you bet. Uh, Jim Heider, um, manager at Concepts to Solutions. Uh, known on Kit and Joe for 12, 13 years now. Um, operational side of it, functional user. Um, really for the last 20 some years, what I've done is project work primarily on WMS, but um, veered off and spent five or six years on the ERP side of it. Um, working with that end user, sitting between the developers and operations. Um, and that's kind of where, where I play really well. Well, thanks for joining me today, Ankit. I appreciate your time. I wanted to take, uh, take an opportunity today to talk about implementing WMSs. Like they are sometimes big, and hairy and tough to do. Uh, there's a lot of planning that kind of goes on behind the scenes or at the beginning of the project. Uh, and even when it's all planned out, there's still just you know thousands of things to consider uh, and, and, they're, and they're tough. So I wanted to get with an expert and talk about like what that process is like and what are some things we should watch out for or what are some things we should think about when we're, we're diving into you know putting a WMS into an operation. Yeah, uh, very, uh, very broad, very, very open-ended. So we'll try and narrow this down uh, piece by piece, topic by topic. But, but yes, uh, interesting, interesting space. Uh, this is, uh, I've spent my entire career just implementing WMSs, um, which is so very close to my heart as well. But I think uh, if, if you break it down to just the, the planning part of it, uh, when you're planning um, uh, or... or and we're not going to get into the WMS selection aspect of it, assuming that that's already done. So you've yeah. decided on a vendor and uh, you have a vendor in mind, you're working with them. Mm -hmm. So now you get to uh, just planning as to how this implementation is going to go about. So uh, first things uh, first would be to just ensure that you have a, a, a great team put together. Just uh, you need buy-in from uh, all your stakeholders. So if it's, if it's an IT initiative, uh, um, uh, you need the buy-in from the business, the operations, uh, and each operational is just uh, the, the leads in each of the functional areas, uh, whether it's shipping or uh, <clears throat> uh, just, just because the uh, ops leads uh, have signed off doesn't mean that that's probably uh, enough. So getting the buy-in from, uh, if not the end users, but at least their uh, supervisors and managers down to that level would be great. Uh, change management is going to be key. It's, it's, it's going to be a huge change, uh, especially if it's an existing facility and uh, you are upgrading or implementing a new WMS. Yeah, going from paper to uh, RF overnight could be a whirlwind, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And then uh, and then from the end user's perspective, stuff's working, right? They're doing their jobs and all of a sudden this other people are coming in and they're telling them that, hey, this is not how you do this anymore. So yeah. uh, just a lot of that um, uh, change management is going to be key. Uh, and then uh, assess the scope of uh, of what your changes are going to be, uh, and then when you're doing that those uh, design session, it's it's very important to not start to get to solutioning uh, 
too early. I, I think, yeah, yeah. Understanding, understanding what gaps you have, understanding what processes there are, mapping them out, uh, really slowing things down uh, in the beginning is to understand that you understand the problems that we're trying to solve. Don't come in with a solution in mind because then you're not addressing the problem correctly. Yeah, yeah we, we actually run into that. when Even when we're designing hardware, uh, someone will say, hey, I want this machine. And we look at the design requirements and like, this is, this is a mismatch. So yeah, it, I think it's a super excellent point. So let's talk about like the, the kind of overall, like the really big steps in like, in like scoping and planning like a WMS. So like, what's the first thing? We got a good team together. Um, let's assume we have buy-in, right? It's a big assumption. So what's the, what's the first thing that that team needs to look at? I assume it's scoping. Yeah, I, I so uh, definitely a, a site visit or, or even if it's, uh, even if it's a greenfield and, and you still have racking coming up, it is important to have a visual for the uh, at least the key stakeholders. So you 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 see where the operation is going to be, how big a space you have. A lot of times, I I worked at one facility where we designed this whole um, uh, shipping dock very remotely, and just the the lanes and and the and the space on the dock just wasn't enough to be able to cater to all of these. Uh, uh, shipments that, that we're going to go out. So having a visual of that is, is key. And then just lining out your processes, you start high level, uh, we call it the, the first level process that, hey, this is, and then you keep drilling down second level flows, third level flows. By the time you get to the fourth level flows, you're adding each, each uh, more and more detail as you drill down. And then by the time you get to your fourth level flows, you almost have the system uh, designed as well at that point. So it's an iterative process that continues on as you're defining every step along the way. And then by the time you get to the fourth level, you're defining even go to this screen, click this, click that. So what's, a, what's a first uh, level flow? Is that like receiving process? Is like the first level flow or is the first level flow like the entire building inbound, outbound? Like what's, what, help me understand that. Uh, so uh, first level flow would be, uh, uh, would be product coming in. So uh, uh, driver arrives. So if, if you're, if you're, and again, these flows would be by functional area. Okay. So yes, to your point. If we are doing a, a functional uh, uh, flow for receiving, then it would be, yes, driver checks in, driver um, uh, pulls up to the door, product is unloaded, product is received, product is put away. That is level one. Okay, so it's Very, super uh, big Lego blocks, just plug them in. Okay. Correct. And then this is important to lay out is because what we've talked about is, is probably the most vanilla scenario, right? You may have some value added services coming in. You may have... Uh, you may know that um, that that is kind of mandatory for ninety percent of your products. So you would you would design that in the first iteration it, itself. Because whether or not uh, your inbound flow is going to be very uh, generic, it, this first level will clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it's not, you zoom into each each one of those. So that okay, product uh, product is getting unloaded. What kind of product is it? Is it mixed queue? Is it ASNs? Uh, you would define into that. So that the level of detail would now on the second level would be that, hey, okay, if I have an ASN, then it's already identified. I'm just kind of really moving inventory from the truck because the inventory is already created in the system. I'm, I'm, I'm just moving inventory from the truck into the four walls versus if you need to identify and if it's coming in blind, then you're verifying whether it is indeed uh, or you're really creating the inventory at that time because this is, you have no uh, idea of what, uh, uh, what package dimensions it is. You obviously have a PO, so you, you're expecting yeah. uh, what what SKUs to receive, but they could show up in four packs or six packs or 12 packs and you'd have no idea. Okay. So that, that's that's a full surprise. So, um, and you may have both of those. So then level two will split that out saying that, hey, if you have blind receipts, you do this. If you have ASNs, then you do this. Okay, but still pretty still pretty operational level, right? Like it's, you're, you're going to receive this operative. way and then, and then you put it away. Right. Okay. And then third, third level, like what, what, what are we down to now? So like, I know it's a, a blind receipt. I received my blind receipt. Mm -hmm. what, what does that look like? Um, I, I think third level, you'd start talking about the exception scenarios as well, saying that if this okay. happens, how do you account for that? Uh, that uh, if um, you would receive unexpected items, how do you handle that? Uh, if, if you have an ASN and you still have, uh, or if you're receiving short, uh, how do you do that? Uh, when you're closing out the POs and you have over receipts or under receipts, how do you define your tolerance levels? How much over receipt is it allowed? How much under receipts or just are there any audit requirements for the vendors uh, sending stuff over? 
uh, that's really when you get to the third level and you're drilling down uh, and defining those particular use cases. And this this probably uh, and it, <clears throat> it's not it's not a set in stone that hey level one does this, level two does this, level three does this. But I it's just I'm just trying to uh, give an example of how you would start to zoom yeah. in into each process um, at a time and how you would you would start at the thirty thousand uh, foot elevation and then just start slowly zooming in. And you may even have breakout sessions in smaller groups that, hey, go knock this process off. Yeah, figure uh, figure out what a blind group. receipt looks like. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And so the, by the time you're at step or the, the fourth level, those are something like in process design. We call those like work instructions. It's like log yeah. in with this login and password and, and go to this function yeah. one and go to function two, enter this this way. So those are the actual like instructions you're going to hand to an operator. Exactly. And that's a great point, Joe, because um, you're not getting to the level four until you have the SOPs locked down and until you are actually handing out those work instructions. Because uh, level four is really just um, the mode of communicating the processes is, like you said, through SOPs and work instructions. Yep. And that's really, um, it, at least in, in my experience, I haven't seen people referencing a flowchart. Uh, and 11.4 and digging into, hey, what do I need to do? They're just looking at the work instructions instead. So level four, when you're documenting that, it's just to document when, like, if if you need to resolve, uh, hey, how, how do you do this? Is there are multiple ways to do anything. Uh, it would come back to that. But eventually these level fours will be built off of SOPs first and then work instructions next. And that's the level of detail. It's just in a flow chart now. So because... A warehouse associate, they have a work instruction. They're doing one job every day. Yeah. You may not, or they may not understand how this affects the, the um, overall, so yeah. the, next mm, yeah. the overall scenario. So that's that's really when it helps to see that overall flow. It's important for the warehouse associates to see this as well. So they appreciate what they're doing is how that's making an impact into the overall process, how, how, how they're making a difference in the overall end goal. Yeah. Okay. So so I've, I've, uh, I've had the the good fortune of going through uh, a system like this with you. Um, it, and, and, and I think one question is in, in this planning phase, uh, these are like, we kind of talk about there, there's some flows, but this is a lot of work. So how much like resourcing should, should someone plan on to, to get through something like this on like a tier one WMS, like a, like a blue under? <clears throat> it really depends on the scope. So uh, obviously in, in the ones that we've been a part of have been kind of, Kind of tier one very large operations uh, i remember the warehouse was a mile long yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just driving down so um it would require just a, a lot of resources a, a lot of factors dictate that as well budget but if 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 we don't have the constraints if you just want to design the ideal stuff then you would start with um operational um experts definitely who understand the distribution uh operations um who can map out the process flow so you would use tools like um, synthesis or lucid charts to kind of uh, define these levels of details so you got to have a program manager project manager who's kind of just guiding through and who's uh, creating a schedule out projecting it out uh, ensuring resources are utilized uh, you would definitely have wms experts uh, from um, solutions architect are probably key to uh, getting a project like this kick started because they understand the capabilities and the limitations of the software uh, while they still understand uh, and they're, they're not just uh, tech focused they understand the operations as well and they're able to guide uh, build solutions when you start to solution products there's always this question that hey standard product wms does not do this is it what's is it is it more efficient to change the process around what the product offers or is it uh we want to throw a mod is the yeah uh, uh, you want to yeah. don't say it yeah <laughs> <laughs> or you want to throw a mod in there or are there can we get creative configuration uh th those are the things so uh a solutions architect from a wms standpoint being engaged very early who has the buy-in uh and then this the when you when we were talking about buy-in from all stakeholders, it's also from the vendor experts, the software experts' perspective as well, right? They're bought into the process that this is the process, and this is what we said we do. How do you fulfill that? Um, uh, that's that's about the uh, uh, the key uh, everyday uh, components. Obviously, operations uh, uh, supervisors, uh, 
as you're designing it and defining it. Uh, the, uh, w- once once you assess the uh, the scope and you've done a, a solution summary document or you've done a proof of concept even, uh, I think once that design is locked in, you go down to designing it, the engagement from the operation starts to reduce okay. until you're ready to uh, engage them for user acceptance testing. So all the designing, uh, after the design's done, design's locked down, scope's locked it's, down. It's pretty straight right? Yeah. 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 And then you engage them again at user acceptance testing. And then um, there's a lot of, oh, we didn't think that this is going to be like this. Or so there, there's still a lot that gets lost in translation. Yeah. Um, so again, um, throughout the process, um, just engaging, just constant communication. Uh, the change management, the project manager, so like sticking with everybody is a, is a big deal. Absolutely. Change management is probably the most critical aspect of it. Just so many, um, uh, so many resources involved and, and to be able to make sure that everybody is on the same page at the same time at all times okay. is, is a full-time job in itself. That checks out. Uh, is there is there any thing to say about like so not all WMSs are created equal like some of them are like big and they have tons and tons of configurations already built into them you can do a lot and then some WMSs are kind of like for lack of a better word light um, is there any notes on like you know like the resourcing differences between the two like are they is it the same process that you have to go through either way or is it? A lot of that is actually application uh, dependent as well okay. as to how open or closed the, the WMS itself is. All right. uh, something like a Blue Yonder traditionally, and again, that's changing now with the advent of SaaS and, and just the products evolving. But um, Blue Yonder is something that we've got a lot of experience in and, and that's very open. Like developers could come in and read the, the code behind uh, stuff they could they could actually trace uh, and understand how the code is flowing they could override those standard commands uh, and uh, put something technical in place that would completely change the way um, the operation or, or the the application would function yeah. um, so uh, <clears throat> i think those determine uh, the the application that you have uh, determines what level of engagement you want uh, and, and and again we we skipped the part of wms selection yep. here but if you know that you've got a very, uh, very different operation, or you've got something uh, special going on that you you believe that is not the industry norm, you need a lot of customization, with, right? You need a lot of customization, exactly. And then there, that's a whole another debate in itself. Okay. But every operation thinks that they are unique, uh, and, and uh, it, it, it certainly is. But it's it's not as much as it's made out to be. Has been my experience as well. Okay. So every, that, that's what keeps. Hard job is very interesting because every operation is indeed unique. You get it. You can spend 15 years doing this and you go to a new implementation and you learn something new. Yep. Uh, so, so certainly uh, how much, uh, how rich, how feature rich the WMS is, it takes that. But, but a lot of times uh, um, um, your decisions are based off of that, hey, if you've got a custom process that you really need to work with, uh, then we'll go with something that gives us that ability to customize that yeah. so um and and not to say that uh certain wms's are more custom than the others it's just how the customizations are done um yeah sometimes uh, <clears throat> the uh the implementation seems have the full freedom to change and implement it however they want sometimes partners like it to us get engaged and partners then have a framework to work within uh uh, within uh, with the WMS provider and the WMS vendor, and then they work with there. Or sometimes it's just we're just going to scrap this and going to rewrite our own shipping or uh, side of or shipping auditing or just pack stations. We've, we've been a project where we've completely redesigned uh, an outbound audit where it's it essentially replaces the standard pack station functionality yeah, wow. uh, for a dot com uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, for a dot com operation. So um, the ability to uh, uh, ability of the software, the vendor itself, what expertise you have, and how custom your operation is, and uh, I, I don't think I've really answered your question directly, but those are all the variables that come into play to determine how you would staff it. Okay, so so it sounds like if you have a, a process that just requires a lot of customization, it's a very unique thing. Then maybe a a bigger, you know, more difficult to wrestle 
WMS with lots of features and ability to customize is the way to go. And if you think you can get away with the more productized, I think I've heard that in the past, our, our, our software is a product. It's all just com some configurations. If you can get away with that, it might be a lot lighter and lift, right? But you're going to be limited. Like you're not going to be able to customize everything you want, right? Maybe yep, that's, yep, exactly. that's the that's the spectrum we're sliding up and down. But at the specialization, like into like JDA or like tier one WMS is like being able to go in and like recode stuff. Like that's a that's a specific set of capabilities that I don't think we have. That like the K two S team is very much dialed right. in on. It's yeah, the level yeah. of complexity of that stuff is mind numbing. So it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our expertise has been in Blue Yonder, um, formerly JDA. Uh, so, so definitely, if we, if we dial into they change names every five uh, years. Yeah. <laughs> we dial into a lot of that, uh, uh, but but again, our, our approach has been a more application agnostic. So, not really um, on the. Uh, we're diversifying our experience in uh, portfolio beyond Blue Yonder as well, right. and Softy on WMS being the latest one. Which did you uh, experience, Brian, at uh, UPS? Uh, I did not, not at UPS, but we have um, explored them in the past as as potential partners um, prior to the acquisition and us having our own, you know, WES, WMS, WCS platform. So I've got a little bit okay. of familiarity with them. Interestingly, okay. it turns out Ankit has some familiarity with Fastcore because ah. I, I guess that was bolted into like the TMS for the old JDA Red Prairie stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The fast forward TMS tool, like the old school, probably built on .NET or something, uh, was the engine, the partial engine behind the Red Prairie WMS back in the day. I didn't know that. Uh, so, so Red Prairie Parcel shipping would actually call Red Prairie Parcel. And Red Prairie Parcel was nothing, just a shell outside of fast core dms so anybody who was into the tech at that time would know fast core nobody else would know fast core because i i would literally write commands to uh to make calls to fast core tms and get tracking numbers from them through and then all the setup all, all the carrier setup for us was done in fast core tms okay red for you was, was just a, a shell uh red free parcel shell uh, yeah I did, I did not know that interesting small world right and there <laughs> yeah, and that was that was actually my really my first expertise at Red Prairie. I, I came to be known as the fast forward parcel guy, huh. uh, which I've worked very hard towards uh, shedding that tag, and I think I'm successful. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you back in there, man. <laughs> yeah, the, you, it's funny how those things kind of cling on for quite a while, right? So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and Jim, Jim owns the um, uh, the operational side of uh, anything we do at K2S is, is going to be a little humble about uh, it. But any BAs, any, any non-technical projects, resources, anything, they would all report up to uh, Jim. So all business analysts who would view, uh, we, we talked a lot, Joe, uh, Joe, about just requirements and not solutioning it yep. while you're trying to um, determine uh, the gaps or, or determine what the solution is going to sure. be. So. That's what Jim himself and his team would bring to the customers. Yep. And yeah, so like up to this point, uh, we've kind of gone into like some of the super high level stuff about like how you plan a WMS like system, super high level. Um, we got a little bit into scoping, not too much. We're trying to avoid that to a certain degree Sure. Uh, for today. Uh, and then we talked about, you know, like what is it, what is that? kind of planning process look like. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like there's people that are attached to all these processes and, and systems uh, and, and user experience, like sometimes can make or break a process. I don't, I don't get you, you beat up change management a lot. And I know Brian does a lot of change management work as well. Like it, it, it's the difference between a good execution and a bad one. I, like I think in most of my experience, do you want to speak to more uh, of that? Like, like wh what is a good experience maybe for a, an operator and, and how do you, how do you get there, Jim? Um, what's a good experience for an operator? So the operational team, um, I think it's opening the floor and uh, encouraging that conversation. Um, I, I don't know if it was fear. I don't think there was fear there, um, but not enough encouragement. Um, uh, I, I think, I don't know if you even set the table when we sat down, right? I don't think we talked about, um, you know, what's acceptable and not acceptable, but I, I just didn't feel enough of the, uh, I want to hear your experience, right? We did the tour. Um, we walked, we did a tour. There was 20 of us. I was the only guy with a notebook. 
I'm like, why are we doing a tour if nobody's taking notes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, took a couple pictures. Um, almost felt like it was a foregone conclusion. So I'm not sure if I nailed your question though, Joe. Ask it again. I, I think you're. I think you're pretty close. Like, like what? Like, how do you make? Uh, how do you go through this design phase of, of a of a big WMS implementation and make sure that you're like getting, I guess, maybe the feedback from the operational folks? Like, how do you set the stage? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be real deliberate, right? You got to talk about it. Uh, if you don't talk about it, if you don't set the stage, talk about it, um, you're not going to get there, right? It's a very, very important piece. Um, sometimes you begin with the end in mind and explain uh, what people want, wh what we're trying to get to and how we're going to get there, right? Sure, and Jen, I'm, I'm I'm sure you're used to it, right? There's always so many different competing priorities, right? Between what is the IT organization's need, what is the management organization's, what's the finance organization's, and then ultimately the operators who have to live with it sometimes fall almost in the bottom of that priority stack. Um, I think for for a lot of those reasons, right? So what you're what you're describing, I think, is not unique to any certain client. Um, and it's a big challenge I think all of us have in this space, whether we're doing a, a full-on WMS implementation or an upgrade or even a, just a, a hardware change, right? It's, it's how do you encourage those voices um, from all of the different facets and stakeholders and make sure everything is heard. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do um, in organizations. Yeah, it is difficult. You know, it's, it's difficult to have a safe zone. You know, it's okay, it's okay to speak um, no matter who's in the room, right? Uh, I briefly touched on just uh, who the implementation team comprises of and then who who, who really gets engaged. Uh, and then uh, uh, Jim might have some specific answers as well as just from his recent experience that you mentioned, Jim, uh, 20 people in uh, in the design session or the requirements gathering stuff, but who are the representatives, like what teams and, and what roles and, what, and did you find any missing uh, as well that um, should have been there? Um... Now let me just go through and kind of list off who was there, no names, um, and maybe we'll figure out who was missing. Um, we had AGM, assistant general managers. We had a general manager, uh, in and out, busy guy. Um, ops managers from receiving outbound and uh, inventory control. Inventory control was in all the sessions, receiving on the receiving side, and op. Uh, actually receiving sat through everything too. Then the outbound ops managers. Um, we did, um, we had a kind of a sticking point on inventory control where we needed to get a little bit more in depth, um, although we had the procedures, so we would kind of talk through the process. Um, we'd, uh, well, we did, the, we did the visit on the floor where we talked through the process and we bring up the SOP. Um, but we we did kind of a deeper dive on, into one of the specific processes. And we, needed to bring, we needed to bring in a specialist, right? Somebody had been there for, uh, I think she had been there for 15 years. Um, so maybe we needed to bring in some more of these specialist type people. Um, yeah, just thinking out loud. Um, you know, we had managers, we had uh, uh, directors from IT, a couple of them, um, uh, the functional side as well as the technical side. We had uh, developers with us, um, myself as a business analyst. Um, um, so we, we brought in a lot of good people. Um, trying to think. And any representation from uh, the uh, software vendor themselves? Yeah, we did have somebody from, uh, from Blue Yonder with us. Um, the product that we're working on is heavily customized. So I think Bridget, the, the um, understanding of how we're using it and how um, Julianne designed it, maybe could have gone into a little bit more of that. Uh, he was very technical. Um, so there might've been a little gap on how we were using our changes and how it impacted the operation. Um, but yeah, we did have Julianne there. Um, you know, I think one thing that probably would have benefited a lot of people is just kind of taking a time out and saying, um, you know, you don't have to get into all the configurations, but there's probably a half dozen configurations out there that have a tremendous impact on how things work, right? Yep. I think taking a time out, and then, and I, I don't mean just a few minutes, maybe a day or two, and explain those high level configs, right? Um, so people understand it. Um, well, config isn't, all that difficult, um, but if you don't know it, 
it's a mystery, right? Mm -hmm. And and people then don't want to take that next step deeper and under understand how it works. But I think if we would have took a couple of days and just you know, uh, we already know where our pain points are within the operation. So maybe focus on how those configs come together. So people are all, we're all in the same. Yeah, I, I agree, Jim. I think, and we talk about implementation as a whole, right? Uh, uh, a lot of times that gets misconstrued as, hey, you got to know the behind the scenes stuff. Or you got to know the tables through the columns right. or the code, but that's, that's not really it. I mean, there are systems that are so close that you would never get into that really the implementation skill is to understand the product capabilities and the configuration options, right? And just because you've used a configuration option one way doesn't mean that that's the only way that works. So just really recognizing, understanding how robust AWMS application is, what the configurations really mean, what they're designed for, what are the use cases for it, and how you can mishmash two different configurations and a completely third different outcome uh, is, is key. So understanding that, uh, learning that, and a lot of that comes with experience, but just training on how to implement AWMS um, mm -hmm. is, is, is key. And I, I think that's so important, right? If you tie that back to getting those different user stories, right, on, 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 on the, the, the pain points, the successes, the challenges, and then understanding that whole operational flow from everybody's perspective, because you're right, right? One, one configuration setting incorrectly can just derail uh, a successful, otherwise a successful project. Um, so taking that time on the front end uh, to what Jim said, right? Creating that safe space for people to come in and, and share their opinions without, you know, uh, feeling like they're challenging decisions in the past, right? Because everybody comes in um, to, to organizations and they, they make the, the best decision they can, with the information they have at the time with positive intent. Right. And so, but things change, right. And, and most people don't change WMSs, you know, year over year, they're, they're selecting a product for a very long period of time. There may be enhancements and upgrades, but uh, even those, the major enhancements and upgrades aren't being done on an annual basis for most organizations. And so um, in today's world, there is a dramatic uh, shift in order profiles, processes, SKUs, um, and, 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 you know, there's mergers and acquisitions that could change the operating flow of warehouses, potentially, if you, you've got a new business unit you're bringing in. And, and so really just breaking down those barriers and understanding, you know, it, it's, it's a new world today, right? It's been five years maybe since we, we've gone through this exercise, or some cases, 10 years, right? And it, it's okay to, to break down those barriers and have an honest conversation about today's state, keeping in mind maybe some decisions that were made. Sure, it's always great to understand why something was done. But let's focus more on where are we at today and how do we take that in a sustainable way into the future? And so yeah. that's what. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Brian, just just to build build further on top of that. We're actually doing uh, an assessment for for another uh, site and operations right now. And uh, one of the first things that we called out was that uh, and they have very small operations uh, as of today. So you like you said that you don't you don't you're not in the WMS implementation space every year right, right. It's, not, it's not in every year so uh our first call out to them was that hey just because you have a small operation today it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have that five years down the line right, right? or so so a lot of times uh, and, and this is where the executives uh, um uh, would probably come in as to where the operation do they what's the roadmap for their operations right that's right where are they growing if you're in the WMS election space right now, or if you're in the implementation space right now, don't lock yourself into a design right. that you're going to outgrow in a couple of years. Yeah. Right. So if, if you're selecting um, uh, something based on today's situation, you're already starting off way behind the eight ball. Right. That's a that's exactly. a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So so leave some room, and again, you don't have to design for the scenarios that it doesn't doesn't exist today. But if you have an idea of where your business and operations is headed. Uh, plan for those, make sure that you have the options at that point so you're not locked into something that you're going to outgrow by the time you're done implementing it. I think a lot of that actually mirrors like the mechanical uh, and process design stuff on the other side, right? Like don't paint yourself into a corner. Don't fill everything with rack that you know, if you're going to need some space to grow and then like dig right. into how, how do you think you might grow? Like let's, let's, we are, let's plan for scaling of some type, right? And some information is better than no information. And if you're wrong, it's okay. At least, at least you have, like made some attempts to it. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, a minor nuance there, but uh, just harping on uh, Jim's point there that if you're going on a tour, uh, why is there nobody taking notes? We're just documenting everything, right? Just yes. hey, because things that make sense today may not make sense tomorrow, and especially if it's something that you planned for, just document. Hey, this is the corner case scenario that we may have come up become mainstream tomorrow. Yeah. This is why we're doing this the way that we're doing. Yep. State your assumptions, right? That's right. And state your assumptions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it goes at, at at every level, really. I mean, uh, documenting just uh, your. We talked about process flows, SOPs, work instructions. Obviously, work instructions wouldn't have uh, justification justifications of why you did a uh, certain thing. But even to the tech level, like if you're writing code for a very custom, peculiar process, reference the design that was there in code comments or write what the intended purpose is. Just that just goes a long way because um, implementation teams cycle through um, people um, come and leave, but, but these systems, uh, last for a very long time and then supportability and then uh, oftentimes you're you're done implementing something and now you're supporting it and one new process comes about and then you find yourself that hey in terms instead of trying to support that one new process and build it into the solution you start resolutioning the whole thing you start questioning that hey why was this done a certain way and then that's uh <clears throat> almost naive right you start and you start to change something not knowing what what it was designed for, what it was being intended for, and you're changing something else, and it's it's a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. context it, is it, key, right? It, it is, yep. and I think you know that's that's a great point. Um, we in a project world have that obligation, right? At the end of the day, because because the operations team are our clients, whether we're internal or external, right? We're by definition, right? The project team has a finite end, and we'll move on to the next set of projects. And so, the better we do at documenting. Um, documentate, documentation, uh, and the better we do at having those process flows, work instructions, and the why behind them, the intent, the uh, smoother any enhancements could be in the future uh, for those for those operation and steady state continuous improvement. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, it, uh, from from our perspective, we we try and just define our exit strategy from an implementation as we're embarking on it, because right. that's the best thing, right? I, <clears throat> getting uh, partners and um, <clears throat> consultants on board is not cheap for any operations, right? So <clears throat> they're, they're brought in because the value that they're bringing in, but it's important to have that open conversation with the uh, <clears throat> with the operations and, and the customer or the client as well, it, saying that, hey, this, this is what we want to bring in. This is the time in which we want to bring this in. And this is when when we deliver on the scope, we should um, walk out. So, so then we were actually implementing, uh, and it's not a constant design, just it, it <clears throat> You get too used to just working with a team and working with people and just goes on forever sometimes. Right. And it's it's really better for everybody. It can sound kind of harsh, right? But it's at the end of the day, right? I want the keys to my new car and to be able to drive it. And so I don't need the dealer to sit there and show me, you know, give me the overview, but I shouldn't have to keep going back for questions over and over again, right? Then they didn't do a good job yeah. of explaining that. So you're absolutely right. I think that's that sometimes can seem a little harsh to clients, but it's in everybody's best interest to have a well-defined acceptance and, and exit strategy. So that way you're turning over something holistically and they're able to be completely self-sufficient, right? Um, that would be yep. a win-win. Okay, very cool. Uh, do you guys want to talk about uh, specific um, <laughs> like process design areas where like maybe pe people don't spend enough time? Go ahead. Oh, I was yeah. going to say like things like like having a, an IC process where maybe exceptions are the norm or a quality assurance process, right? stuff like that like so beyond the vanilla path these ancillary processes where you're trying to to shake things loose right um that or uh you know maybe talk about planning for operations that have like uh, maybe more intense regulatory uh, concerns than others so you know if i'm just selling apparel there's not tons of regulatory concerns around it but if i'm in the, the health and wellness pharmaceuticals uh maybe even a USDA or an FDA facility like that, that is very, very different uh, from a planning perspective and then from an execution perspective. Jim, I'd rely on some, some input uh, from you uh, as well. But one of the things that stands out to me always is we focus a lot. And then even in our conversations, Joe, earlier we talked about inbound. We've talked examples of outbound. The thing that always gets left behind is inventory control. Mm. Uh, IC is overlooked. Uh, it is supposed to be a, a, 
uh, maintaining a uh, department, if you want to call it, but inside a warehouse. So it's not really helping you get product in or ship product out and ship product out as king. Yep. Granted, makes sense. Um, but inventory control is really just what puts it all together, keeps it all together. And to be able for you to be able to ship product out, um, IC is going to make sure that inventory is accurate. Um, so that's something that often gets overlooked. Um, and understandably so that it is it is a third priority in terms of designing an operation, right? You talk about inbound first, then you talk about outbound, and then piece in. Um, so from my experience, it doesn't get as much um, time and attention, uh, probably because of not enough time allocated for that subject. The day we ended up spending two extra days on inbound and two extra days on outbound, and no, oh, we've got just three hours for IC. Yeah, and it's okay. Uh, but it's not okay. I think uh, a lot of times, and uh, uh, just how this strategy on how you're going to make sure that your inventory is accurate, and not just today, but what's your continuous strategy to make sure that it is accurate, it is always going to be accurate, and you're keeping up with your um, cycle counts if you have it. That uh, uh, how many, uh, w- what the rules are around. Uh, your if you have the ABC SKUs or the location that hey my high velocity is going to be counted three times a year mediums are going to be twice and I'm going to count these SKUs just once a year but how do you make sure that you are actually um, and then um, just the touch points because every time there is a touch point in in a warehouse location that is when uh, you have a chance of something going yeah. wrong or something or an opportunity to find out if something went wrong as well so not just uh, retroactively. Uh, looking at it, but just uh, preemptively that, hey, I'm already here for picking. Do I implement... Uh, count near uh, zero or something uh, like that? Zero or a count back or something mm-hmm. like that. Do I do that? Um, and then also what I've seen is um, operations, most traditional operations are just very compartmentalized. But, hey, these are my picking guides. These are my IC. These are my cycle counters. These are my um, receivers. Um, there's not a lot of... Um, uh, interleaving or just task interleaving between those departments. And uh, it's sometimes it's a cultural thing and you just accept it and move on. But but ideally, uh, like I said, there's anytime you're visiting a warehouse location, it's an opportunity to do more, yeah. right? If I can save the travel time for somebody to get there. Yeah, you've already paid to have that person drive across a mile long building, right? Like that's exactly. good to get your money's exactly. worth, right? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, but that, again, uh, warehouse efficiency, um, is is a whole another uh, beast of a topic, right? So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, a ball of wax. We'll save that one. Yeah. Right, so, so, yeah, but, so uh, how, and maybe this is a gym question, but how, how do you make sure that that folks spend the right amount of effort, um, you know, opening opening this ICQA kind of topic up and make sure they do it justice? Yeah, you know, I mean, IC is a it's a it's a tough conversation to have, right? Um, you know, it's a fixed cost, so um, you're only allocated so many resources. Uh, when you design processes, your processes should be pretty locked up and pretty tight, right? So your executive team is expecting your receiving to work um, IC free, right? They're expecting your outbound processes to work IC free. It's a beautiful uh, dream. Yeah. We had a, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had a, a group that was uh, super comfortable with our IC team never getting um, out of their chairs with the exception of cycle counts, right? Mm. We had executives who would say, I don't care if my IC team never leaves the office. If you can get your building running so well that you don't need to rely on IC, they don't need to do anything, okay? Uh, but that's not reality. Uh, but what is reality is you can, oftentimes can't predict um, where those resources are gonna be needed, right? So if I'm a receiving manager and I'm having an issue with a with an item, I'm calling IC, they're a fixed cost. My guys have to be working and they have to have output. Mm. So all these things kind of get dumped on IC. And, and, you know, they're expected to know the system a little bit better than everybody else. They probably have better soft skills than other people. They're, they're pulled in a lot of ways. You know, Brian, you talked about finance, the general ledger impact. Um, they're really, really, really responsible for a lot. Um, and it's, it's difficult to design around those processes, right? We understand you need to do an ABC count. We understand the building has to be counted every year, right? But what we mm-hmm. don't understand is vendor A, um, who can't 
ship in a case pack um, and doesn't label their product very well, we don't have a good grasp on that. We can't predict some of this stuff. Uh, right. So that's that's some of the challenges that I see is you just don't know what you don't know. Um, and just think about all the processes that the external processes that are out there to at the end of the day to support your IC team, right? Whether it's, um, you know, vendor compliance, um, carrier compliance, you know, all those big, big, big teams sitting up at your corporate level at the end of the day, they're there to support that inventory team. And, um, you know, um, it's just hard to predict what's going to happen and what levers to pull. So I think that's a big challenge. But uh, is there any techniques you use to like make sure like you try to do it justice the first time through, so you're not coming back and doing a bunch of mods or additional work after the fact to try to get IC right? It's 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 frustrating when you realize that hey, this process is not not really designed as well as the in and out flows, right? So how how do you how do you how do you structure that like scoping? Uh, design those conversations in the beginning to make sure you do it, or is it like a resourcing question? Like it's always gets left to the end, so you, you're, you're just out of hours. Or um, I don't think it, I don't think it gets to the point where it's out of hours. Um, I think most teams are willing to to invest the time to to sort it out. Um, okay. But what what are your you know your damages? Right, you're certainly going to talk about damages and other process. Um, Dems, you're going to talk about Dems and whether it's Cuba Scan or some other way to get. Um, Accurate DIMS um, shortages. Um, you're going to talk about those. Um, um, yeah, sometimes it's an integration issue, right? And you're all of a sudden doing a workaround because your integration doesn't work right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, just uh, spotting of trends as well, right? That every time this happens or every time these views are incorrect, <clears throat> just uh, identification of those uh, starting of a trend, the saying if you if you're cycle counting it. Um, those those are some things that um, I see uh, could, uh, and, and of course, uh, IT is going to help uh, drive uh, some of that as well. But just ident identification of the trend saying that hey, this is always wrong. What's going on with this queue, right? Just um, um, alerts on that would be. Uh, but <clears throat> for me, the the interesting uh, thing was uh, Jim, how you mentioned that I C is fixed cost, right? Because uh, how many uh, inbounds and outbounds are like? Hey, how many units per minute uh, or are we processing? It's all it's variable, very, right? Very, yeah, it's all it's all variable, and then and there's there's probably incentives uh, for that as well, right? As to how how more efficient you could be, but IC is is fixed cost. So um, uh, I've, I've never looked at it that way, um, which which is which is great insight, uh, and that may be just uh, more telling in how and why I see is, <laughs> is a distant third uh, in terms of when, when you're looking at departments uh, as well. Um, but there, there's still ROI, even if it's fixed fixed cost, there's still opportunity for ROI, right? Absolutely. As to how we can do that. Uh, uh, last year, I think uh, uh, we, were, uh, we were in an operation where we said that, hey, it's uh, uh, beginning of Q4 or sometime in early November, and we said, hey, we've done our cycle counting quota for the year. So that was great. It was a great win for the IC team because we've got a month and a half left in the year and we've already done with the quota. So we just have to keep up with anything else that happens in until the rest of the year. So then those IC associates were available and freed to be used in other parts of the warehouses because the second tasks uh, as far as from the external audit pers uh, perspective was done. So, um, um, so, so a well-designed IC process could lower that fixed cost burden, and, and then it's not just uh, well, we have to have IC. Let's just deal with it, right? You, you can you can flip exactly. the script, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely, exactly. Uh, w one of the challenges we had, and especially with with that process, was uh, <clears throat> when I was talking about just trends from from the warehouse uh, IC workers as well. Um, they would often find themselves cycle cycle counting same or similar locations very often together like why i just counted this location yesterday why am i having to count this again mm -hmm. what's going on uh, so uh, and at least in that case uh, it was a disconnect in the system that if you've got scheduled counts uh abcs uh that you're doing on a schedule anyway and if you've got unscheduled counts because you had a cancel pick come up from here mm -hmm. so somebody says hey go count this location to make sure it's okay 
the unscheduled counts wouldn't count towards your annual quota. So you could have counted that same location yesterday because there was some picking exception happened from there. And then you do that as a part of the unscheduled counts, but your scheduled count still doesn't cover that you count that location. Mm -hmm. So you go through that one more time again. So it's kind of an, in, an so, inefficient config that there, right? That we, that we didn't catch that. Yep, yep. So um, well, that could be a lot of yeah, money, yeah. like in hours, right? Like sending, sure. sending people back to the same location again and again and again. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely. So, so yeah, and I think part of, part of our solution there was to just identify this and give credit that if you count at this scheduled or unscheduled, we're going to give you credit for counting it in terms of annual quota. Right. Uh, so we would skip over those locations or just assign credits uh, behind the scenes to say that, okay, it does, it does indeed make sense. Do you find that a lot of customers are comfortable with like the opportunity or counting your zeros or, or, you know, some type of like triggered standard operator count where the picker does lots of the counts uh, in an operation like that. And the IC does kind of the remainder. Like how comfortable are folks with that? Cause some, you know, I, I've, I've worked with GMs and they're like, man, IC has to count it cause they're the only ones that can count. And I know that that's not and true. That's exactly what we've uh, uh, seen as well. And and, and I, I don't know, uh, at least uh, from my sample set, uh, it's primarily just uh, large scale operations with tier one WMSs, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's the trend only with such large operations, maybe uh, smaller operations may be more open to it, but but definitely um, IC is going to count it. That's, that's the thing that we always see. So count near zero is just, uh, and that's the closest thing that you could do, right? To yeah. having a picker perform a count. Is there one and, or is there zero? Like that's, it's, you should be able to tell. And, and, and you know, it, it's funny. That's, that's, that's really what I was backing into Joe is um, the count. Uh, we, we, we talked our way into implementing a count near zero at a facility at a, at a trial. But let's see how this goes, mm -hmm. right? Let's see. Let's assess the impact. And if it's just a flag in the configuration, we'll turn it off. We don't want to do it. Yep. And then just a handful of uh, pickers were trained for this as well, saying that, hey, you will see this prompt when you're picking this, and this is what you got to do. So it was a very controlled test. Yep. And uh, I, I wouldn't say it fell flat on its feet, but uh, it came back with, Exactly. So a count near zero typically is that, hey, you set a threshold saying that, hey, and we'd set this threshold to be three or four. Okay. And then they would go to a location and system thinks that, okay, you've hit that threshold after you perform the pick. It asks you that, hey, cycle count this location. Uh, and it would be a handful of pieces there, right? Because you've reached that minimum threshold. So it is near zero. So it's not it's not a whole counting task yep. that the picker has to do. Now. But it would just be they would not count it correctly or they would not, they would, they would, and it was it was a, it was a cultural thing, I think, almost that uh, you'd say that hey, just one or zero, just like you said it, yeah. right? Is there one or zero? So, uh, and then the form uh, it, it, on on the on the RF screens from the WMS perspective, it pops up the whole cycle counting form. There's no special form for count near zero. Uh -huh. It's the same form that counters you. So there's a lot of just you have to enter through this, 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 yeah. and you can skip all of that information, but. It was just not. So I said, hey, it, it's not worth it to design a new RF screen form over here. What we just did is just enable the new button on that uh, screen saying that, hey, just tell us whether there's inventory there or not. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. And then we, we trigger it at zero. So we'd say if, if you're picking the location clean, if we think that the location is empty right now, that's when the count near zero gets prompted. And you don't have to look. You, you'll be presented with that form, but we just trained the associate saying that, hey, if you're a picker, you get this form, just press F6, and it's going to complete it for you, and it's and it's going to ask you a question, is it empty or not? So kind of um, simplify that uh, process um, that we couldn't address by training, even though we had a, a smaller set. Yeah. But, uh, and then that, that finally took flight. So it ended up being so, successful, right? After some iteration. It, it, well, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. So it, 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 that's the only uh, implementation of count at zero with a configuration built in and a modification to the existing look and feel of uh, that form. Mm -hmm. That, but, but it should it shouldn't need that level of investment from the tech standpoint. Yeah. Uh, is is on it. But 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 yeah, I, I think uh, there is. It, it, 
I believe it's a cultural thing. It's just very compartmentalized. IC has got to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's very, but, and, yeah. and I, I agree. Uh, can you brought it up a second time? It, it is a cultural thing. Right. And, um, but it, it's also cultural at a kind of a, a grander level, right? Um, taking that extra second for a count near zero. What, what is that emphasizing? What is that telling the team on the floor? What is, what is that telling your IC team, your pickers, everybody? Uh, it's that inventory is, a, is important, right? So these mm -hmm. little stops that we do throughout the day or could do to validate that our inventory is right or correct sends a nice, nice message that, hey, inventory matters to all of us. And for us to be successful, our inventory has to be accurate. You are I take that even a step further, Jim. For me, uh, uh, yes, I mean, that is that is the message, but I would draw that out of that, hey, my replenishment, re replenishments aren't working right, right? I should never be in a spot where I have a count near zero, my inventory should have been replenished before the fact, unless I had an abnormally large volume that cleaned up the location. Um, right. If if your location is empty and you're a forward pick, <coughs> your replenishments are behind. Yeah, they're they're absolutely all they're all connected, right? And it's all connected back mm -hmm. to having uh, you know accurate inventory at every step, at every process, um, at every touch, um, and, and they all tie together, right? And they there's no arguing that some of the stuff takes a little bit longer to do. But I think the question you have to ask yourself is if you do it correctly, does it save time overall? And, and the answer is clearly yes, right? Um, inventory is important. Um, accurate inventory is important. Um, and that's really what makes things hum. Um, the systems are built and designed around accurate inventory, whether it's dimensional data, quantity data, uh, purchase order data, um, everything. Um, that's a super good point. Like, like the underlying assumption in like most process design or like, like software design is that like the information I'm giving it is right. Right. So like I, I'm going to tell you to go get five pieces and there's five pieces there. That, that's an assumption we all kind of inadvertently make. And when yeah. it's not true, the wheels can fall off of it. And then suddenly everybody's like up in arms. But like, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is designed with the assumption that things are correct. Um, and it's a cultural thing. It's a building thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, we take care of our people. We, um, you know, think about um, injuries in the workplace, how much, how far we have gotten and uh, minimize injuries. But, you know, our, our inventory can get injured too, right? And it's a cultural thing. It has to be appreciated that way. Um, we all have to be rooting for the same thing. And I think sometimes that gets missed, right? Um, we're, all, we're all busy and we want our guys to do the best they can and sometimes it's what's best for me is best for me, and that what's best for me, what's best for everybody is best for me. Yeah, and I, I think you're right, right? Those those types of of metrics, those those KPIs, right? They they drive behavior. That's why we need to have them in all of our operations, right? And so the the level of information of of kind of that that healthy push pull relationship of hey, you can count near zero in this example, but then you're, that's good, right? You're able to save some time and you're driving that behavior of inventory is extremely important, inventory accuracy. But on the flip side of that, now we're having a lower, uh, our, our replan strategy is not performing as it needs to because we're driving uh, our, our inventory locations to nothing. And so there's always going to be that healthy push-pull relationship with those metrics to overall drive behavior inside of an operation and, and drive that cultural forward for a culture of excellence. Yeah, I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to come talk to us about this. It's a pretty big topic, it's a pretty important topic. Uh, I think it's something that often like gets overlooked until you're in the middle of it, and then suddenly it's very, very important. And a little, you know, teaspoon of planning out front is, is worth a lot, right? Absolutely, yeah.